get over it. McConnell need to get over it. Eric Cannon need to get over it. And they need to just shut up and do the right thing for the American people. Okay, I'll stop you there because we're short on time. You see the door is opening the floor of the House of Representatives. They're back now. It's noon here in Washington, D.C., 9 o'clock for those of you in the West Coast. And C-SPAN's live coverage from the floor of the House continues. The House will be in order. Prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Reverend Dr. Barry Black, chaplain of the United States Senate, Washington, D.C. Let us pray. Eternal God, today give our lawmakers the wisdom to do what is right, led by you instead of political expediency. Forgive them for the blunders they have committed, infusing them with the courage to admit and correct mistakes. Lord, illuminate their minds so that they will find a solution to the current impasse, embracing your purposes and doing your will. Continue to sustain our law enforcement agents and first responders, inspiring us to emulate their patriotism and self-sacrifice, going beyond applause to ensuring they receive fair and timely compensation. Bless this land we love so much and save us from self-inflicted wounds. We pray in your powerful name. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois arise? Mr. Speaker, uh, the Speaker, pursuant to Clause 1, Rule 1, I demand a vote on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Questions on agreeing to the Speaker's approval of the journal. Those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The journal stands approved. The Mr. gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Speaker, I object to the vote on the grounds that a quorum is not present and make the point of order that a quorum is not present. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question are postponed. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the Chair will entertain up to 15 requests for one minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, as you and I have discussed Tuesday morning, 8,700 employees at Wright Patterson Air Force Base were unnecessarily furloughed. I have voted every single time to fully fund the government, and I have opposed this shutdown. This shutdown is just as harmful to our military readiness as sequestration is, which I also opposed because it undermines our national security. Mr. Speaker, as you know, the Pay Our Military Act was passed by this Congress and signed by the President to ensure our nation's uniformed service members and the civilian employees that support them would be paid in the event of a shutdown. The administration has chosen to ignore this law and force our civilian employees to sit at home and go without pay. I have written to Secretary Hagel and President Obama demanding clarification as to why they have chosen not to follow the law and have furloughed these hardworking people. The Armed Services Committee is holding a hearing to get to the bottom of this clear defiance of the law by the administration. It is past time that we get all men and women back to work and those who work to support our military. I yield back the balance of my time. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Address the House for one minute, Mr. Speaker, and revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, members, I rise 
uh, to recognize the tens of thousands of men and women who work in our fastest growing manufacturing regions in America, Houston and Harris County, Texas. Today is National Manufacturing Day. In our district, which covers the Port of Houston and the Houston Ship Channel, there are over 125 chemical manufacturers, refiners, supporting facilities employing over 33,000 people. The chemical, oil and gas industries are the new face of manufacturing in America. Houston is the energy capital of the world has benefited from this energy renaissance taking place in Texas along the Gulf Coast. Houston has been the national leader in job creation in recent years and the number, America's number one exporting region by the Department of Commerce in July of this year, sending over $110 billion in manufactured exports overseas. I proudly stand with America's manufacturing sector, which is a backbone of our nation's economy and our middle class and look forward to this chamber taking up legislation this Congress to provide the support and statutory clarity our manufacturers need to continue being the international leader in innovation and exports. And I yield back my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, gentleman from Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to recognize the essential contributions manufacturers make in our country. Manufacturing accounts for 47 percent of national exports and 93 percent of exports from my home state, Illinois. In fact, on its own, American manufacturing would be the 10th largest economy in the world. There are approximately 17,000 manufacturing companies creating jobs in Illinois, and nearly 25,000 of their employees work in the 14th district. These men and women produce items we use every day, like plastics and furniture and food products. Other companies rely on them for commercial printing and creating instruments vital to industry. Colleges in my district have recognized the promise of advanced manufacturing and have started programs to train the next generation. While our economy struggles, struggles to jumpstart on this National Manufacturing Day, let's recommit to protect this crucial sector of our economy. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the worst kept secret in Washington, D.C. is there is a majority in this House to pass a clean CR. In fact, this morning, a list of 21 House Republican members was published who said they would vote for a clean CR and it would end this idiotic shutdown that is keeping 800,000 federal employees from doing their job. Unfortunately, a few minutes ago, the official speaker announced that he is not going to listen to the will of this House. Instead, we're going to do these salami slice spending bills. And incredibly, we're going on recess tomorrow through, the end, through, through uh, Monday night. Well, Monday morning in Stratford, Connecticut, thousands of defense workers at Sikorsky Aircraft are not going to be able to go to work because the contract compliance officers from the Department of Defense, who haven't been on the job for the last week, can't certify the helicopter parts and engines that allow them to do their work. Those layoffs are on this speaker's head. This, those layoffs are on the majority party's head. Allow the majority of this House to have a vote. There are 21 of your colleagues that are prepared to do it today, and the president would sign it tonight. Those workers could go to work on Monday and protect the war fighters of this country. I yield back the balance. What purpose is the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, even though the president continues to bully the House by threatening to veto every bill we pass, the House of Representatives continues to act on behalf of all Americans. Yesterday, we passed the Honoring Our Promise to America Veterans Act to fund critical veterans programs of the VA and to ensure proper funding for the National Guard and reservists. Defying common sense, most of my Democratic colleagues chose to turn their backs on our veterans, National Guard, and our reservists. Today, we will act again to provide immediate funding for a critical program that takes care of low-income women and children, the WIC program. Harry Reid's Senate has already refused to step forward and provide funding for sick children, and it would be inexcusable for them to not take up this legislation as well. Harry Reid's government shutdown continues to last, and there is still no sign of willingness to sit down with the House Republicans to negotiate. President Obama has even canceled his trip to Asia, but Mr. Speaker, I have my doubts that he will actually use his time to begin the important conversations that must happen to end this government shutdown. I urge my Democratic colleagues in the House and Harry Reid's Senate to do what's right for the American people, and pass these important funding bills immediately. America needs to be America again. I yield back. The gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition. Without objection, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the early hours of the morning on Tuesday morning, late Monday night, I, along with a number of my colleagues, uh, left our offices to walk over to the House floor to vote after the government had already been shut down. We passed on our way a cleaning crew who was down to half staff with half of her team not here to clean our offices. We are not the ones that make this chamber function, yet we are clearly sending home those that do. They're not a line item in a budget. They've got rents and mortgages to pay, mouths to feed, and children to clothe. But because some of my colleagues have decided that it's better to shut down this government than to provide millions of Americans access to safe and affordable health care, here we are. As we all know, the Affordable Care Act was modeled upon the health care reform that we have already conducted in Massachusetts. So it's worth taking a quick look at where that Massachusetts health care reform stands. We have 100% of all kids covered. We've got 98% of all adult adults covered. We've made certain that no person is now one bad accident or one bad gene away from medical bankruptcy. Regarding cost containment, our rates of increase for individuals and premiums are at 1.8% increase this year. Overall, costs are at G state GSP. We need to get this bill done, and I ask for your help. Fired. For what purpose, the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Consent to address the House for one minute, revised and extend. Without objection, the gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Mr. Speaker, what the American people want from their elected representatives is very much the opposite of what this body has been delivering. Americans didn't want to shut down, but here we are. They didn't want to lose their health care plans, but they have. But a very large number will in the future. They wanted lower health care costs, but insurance rates, they continue to escalate. In Pennsylvania, the Children's Health Insurance Program, which provides good quality, low cost, market based health care coverage, my constituents don't want their children forced out of this program and into medical assistance, but that's now what's happening. If the legislative process worked, we would have amended the so called Affordable Care Act's fatal flaws. If it worked, the repeal of the medical device tax, which has bipartisan support in the House and Senate, would have been sent to the President's desk long ago. It hasn't. It remains chained up in the Senate Leader's office. My constituents know that I don't run all three branches of government. They know it's not my party in the White House or in control of the Senate. But, Mr. Speaker, what they do expect is for me to be their voice in Washington to solve problems, fix government, and put forward solutions. Now, yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, every day that our federal government is closed, our economy gets weaker, and necessary services that the American people that, depend, that de they depend upon for um, are not available to them. But what do we get? Rather than taking up the Senate passed continuing resolution, we get a series of bills to, for PR value that are purportedly intended to reopen government, but nobody is fooled. We know that there's no real intent on the part of the other side to reopen government because you don't want to give up your leverage to try to defeat or repeal or defund the Affordable Care Act. You lost in the House of Representatives. You lost in the Senate. You lost the campaign for the White House on this question. You lost in the Supreme Court. If this were baseball, you hit for the cycle. You lost all four. Look, we know if these bills continue to come to us one or two a day, that you'll have government, you'll have the federal government reopen sometime next spring. Let's do it this afternoon. When we come to this floor, you will have a chance to vote on a clean CR if you bring it up. Let's reopen government today and stop this charade. Thank you, Mr. For Speaker. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Does the gentleman seek unanimous consent? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. President, uh, as the oldest member in the history of this body, I rise with more concern today for our country than ever before. Mr. Speaker, I was a member when we had the last shutdown. It spawned a balanced budget. Today, unfortunately, we have a president and a Senate who are so far are unwilling to negotiate on a budget that will accomplish these same goals. We need to rein in federal government, cut wasteful spending, fix the tax code, protect and strengthen Medicare and national defense, balance the budget, address the harmful Obamacare. And my people tell me to continue to object to Obamacare and don't let up. The president needs to give the American people the same privileges he's given 
to the big business and small business, a one-year delay in the mandate on Obamacare. The Senate rejected all four negotiation attempts proposed by the House. As a result of their refusal, a shutdown of the government. They, with this president, shut this government down. Mr. Speaker, I urge the president and Senator Reid to work with us on a responsible budget. We should all work toward the same goal, protect the best possible opportunity for Americans to prosper, the greatest good for the greatest number, our children. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? I ask unanimous, unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman from Illinois is recognized. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The insistence of some to act irresponsibility and shut this government down is disappointing. But more importantly, it is harmful to the American people, to American businesses, and if prolonged, to the long-term prosperity of our country. Because of this shutdown, over 800,000 government workers are furloughed and don't know when they'll see their next paycheck. In my district, is but one example, 2,500 people at Naval Station Great Lakes, the Navy's only basic training facility, have been told not to come to work. Hardworking people around the country have been locked out of their jobs because some in Congress see fit to hold ideology over good governance. I remind my colleagues that we were sent here to govern and act responsibility, responsibly, but at this moment, Congress is doing neither. The businesses, working families, veterans and seniors in my district and across this country cannot afford for Congress to continue this game. Let's start putting this country on a long-term, fiscally sustainable path forward, and let's do it together. I am and I always will be committed to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to find a solution to this Congress. Mr. Speaker, let's end this shutdown today. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 1836, a dictator showed up at the Alamo in Texas and demanded a complete Full surrender without negotiation. William Travis responded with a cannon shot. There will be no surrender. Now comes the president and the Senate Majority Leader demanding that this House of Representatives surrender. We will not surrender. We're fighting for the American people. Tea Partiers knew in the colonies that King George's dictatorial methods wouldn't be tolerated. We won't tolerate them here. Like it or not, Mr. President and the Senate Majority Leader, this House is a part of this process. We understand that we're fighting for the American people. We will not surrender. We're going to fight to make sure that we keep our liberty. Americans expect nothing less and deserve nothing less. I'm Randy Weber and damn proud to be an American. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Address the House for one minute and revise and extend. Without objection, the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in my district, thousands of government employees are being forced to work without pay. Thousands more have been laid off, all because Congress can't get its act together long enough to do our most basic job, to keep the government running. They're ready, willing, and able to do their jobs, but can't, because Congress has failed to do its job. Folks back home ask me, why do you get paid, but we don't? We're told that the Constitution requires that members of Congress get paid, whether or not they do their job. I think that's wrong, and I've introduced legislation to change it. While folks at home don't get paid, I don't think we should get paid. And I'm not talking about asking the clerk to sit on our checks until after this is over. That's no sacrifice. That's why I'm donating my pay to the Augusta Warrior Project for the duration of the shutdown. I'm giving it to folks who can use it, and I'm calling on all of my colleagues to do the same. It's about accountability, Mr. Speaker. If members of Congress didn't get paid for not doing their job, maybe they'd appreciate those who do their job a little bit more. And I, with that, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, in the weeks leading up to the government shutdown, ABC, NBC, and CBS tried to make sure that it would be the Republicans who were responsible. A media research center analysis found that from September 17th through September 30th, the network's evening newscast ran a total of 39 stories about a possible government shutdown. Of these stories, over half blamed Republicans for the potential shutdown. Not one news report placed the blame on the Democrats. Yet it is Republicans who have passed such bills as keeping the National Institute of Health open and making sure that veterans get their benefits. These bills are opposed by the President and the Senate Democrats. Republicans want to reduce the pain of the shutdown for the American people, but they are blocked by those who want the entire government to remain shut down.
Americans deserve a national media that gives them the facts rather than one that is in the pocket of the Democratic Party. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Speaker, just a few minutes ago, I stood with hundreds of American workers who came to this place that they consider a place of responsibility and respect, holders of the Constitution, to beg for their jobs. They represent a small segment of 800,000 federal employees. And as I was standing there, a representative, Ms. McNeil, from AFGE indicated that this morning she had just received a call from an unemployed federal worker and an unemployed federal husband, a wife and husband. They're in crisis. The woman is now being abused, and they had to escort her to a shelter. Crisis, Mr. Speaker. It's not about surrendering. It's about caring about the American people. It's about caring about Diane, who was able to get health insurance after being diabetic and hearing bad things about Obamacare. And it's about Senator Dole and John Dingell, two World War II veterans who have said, don't insult us with this piecemeal. I ask unanimous consent to put their statement in the record. A Republican and the Dean of the House wants us to stop and put a clean CR for the American people and to end the this time crisis. Has expired. I'm Without here objection. to end the crisis right now. Without objection, I yield back. The document is uh, entered into the record. What purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina seek recognition? Without objection, gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Mr. Speaker, yesterday a bipartisan group of the House passed two common sense pieces of legislation. First, to provide resources for our nation's veterans, and second, to ensure that our men and women in uniform serving in the National Guard and Reserve are able to be compensated for their efforts. We should all agree that legislation designed to protect our national security should be above partisan politics. Unfortunately, Senate Democrats have rejected the legislation. Additionally, the President has already threatened to veto these bills. As a 31-year veteran of the National Guard, I hope for the sake of our brave men and women in uniform and military families that obstructionism will cease. It is now up to Washington Democrats to put politics aside, do the right thing, and protect our national security by promoting these bills. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we will never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. Congratulations to our chaplain today, Senate Chaplain Barry Black, for recently being awarded a doctorate from his alma mater, the University of South Carolina. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Without objection, gentleman from California is recognized. It is a dark day today in America, and the lights of the greatest government of the greatest democracy in the world are out. The only person who can turn those lights back on, the only person who controls the switch, is Speaker John Boehner, not the Tea Party. Turn that switch on, Mr. Speaker. Turn it on for the federal worker at Camp Parks in Dublin, California, who is seeking unemployment benefits and asking to extend the mortgage on his house. Turn it on for the children who are awaiting clinical trials at the National Institutes of Health. Turn it on for our veterans whose claims will be delayed. Turn on the lights, Mr. Speaker, for the hungry women and children who will be affected by delayed WIC funding. Turn on the lights for our Capitol Hill police who stand guard at the People's House without pay. Mr. Speaker, you can turn back on the lights of the government that runs the greatest democracy in the world. Just give us a vote. And I yield back the balance of my time. What purpose does the gentleman from Indiana seek recognition? Does the gentleman seek unanimous consent? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's time to fund the government. So far, House Republicans have passed four bills to fully fund the government. But since then, that wasn't enough for the Senate, and they shut the government down. On a bipartisan basis, we have passed bills to ensure our National Guard, our reservists are paid, we're funding federal be veteran benefits, reopening national parks, reopening the National Institutes of Health, and allowing the District of Columbia to expend their own local funds. All of these passed with bipartisan votes. A clean CR is not the answer. 
A clean CR funds the gold-plated health care plan for members of Congress. Members of Congress cannot be treated one way and the American people another way. We need fairness for every American and to stop the chaos of Obamacare. It's time for Harry Reid and President Obama to come to the table in good faith to work together with House Republicans for the good of all Americans. Let's pass the bills that we have bipartisan support for today. Thank you. I'll yield back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? Yeah, I'm to the for one minute. Without objection, gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Speaker, here we are on day four of a government shutdown that should never have happened. I'm deeply disappointed that my Republican colleagues have decided that their obsession with repealing the Affordable Care Act is more important than the rest of the country, more important than 800,000 government workers going without a paycheck, more important than children and families of less means going without the nutritional support they rely on, more important than providing cancer victims and survivors with the reassurance that this government is continuing with critical research to find a cure for cancer. Why are they letting the shutdown drag on when it could be over today? How much longer do the American people have to suffer? I urge my colleagues to turn this ship around right now and give us a bill that will fund all of the government without any strings attached that restores critical services to our seniors, to our veterans, and to our families. Enough already. What purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Without objection, gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that I and most of the members of this House have voted now for five different measures that would have paid our nation's civilian defense workforce and all of our guardsmen and reservists. The first of those bills passed this House with overwhelming bipartisan support in July, Mr. Speaker, July. Unfortunately, the Senate and the President have refused to pass four of the five measures. And in the Pay Our Military Act, the President unilaterally deemed many of the civilian workforce and National Guard non-essential to our national defense. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but what the President is doing is wrong. The civilian workers that design, build, and maintain our planes, our ships, and our infrastructure, and support our war fighters in everything that they do, are essential and should not be furloughed simply because the President chooses to do so. Every member of our National Guard and Reservists stands ready to defend our nation and they should be paid while we wait on Harry Reid and the President to agree to negotiate. That's why I've introduced the Pay Our Guardsmen and Civilian Defense Personnel Act. Our national security depends on these men and women and they should be paid while we're waiting on the President and Senator Reid simply to do their job and agree to negotiate with us. I urge my colleagues to support this measure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What and I yield back. The gentlelady from Arizona seek recognition. I request unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, gentlelady from Arizona is recognized. Mr. People, Mr. Speaker, the good people in my Arizona district are disgusted with this Congress. They see Washington treating this shutdown as a political game. News reports now confirm that there are enough votes in the House, Democrats and Republicans, to pass a clean funding bill and reopen the government right now. Yet the House GOP keeps bringing up piecemeal bills that are going nowhere, designed to create campaign attack fodder. This week, the House majority cynically used piecemeal votes on veterans and national parks. My district has the Grand Canyon and many national parks, and as a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee, I'm disgusted with these dead-end piecemeal games. And you know who else is disgusted? Veterans. Yesterday, the Commander-in-Chief of the VFW said, and I quote, we expect more from our elected leadership and not a piecemeal approach that would use the military or disabled veterans as leverage in a political game. Mr. Speaker, we must stop the piecemeal games and restart our government now. What purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection, gentleman from Kansas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's no secret that there's plenty to disagree about in Washington, D.C. The House majority continues to believe that funding special treatment for members of Congress in the Affordable Care Act is wrong. 
The House majority continues to believe that the American people need a reprieve from the new government insurance mandate for one year, the same reprieve that has been given to businesses, unions, Congress, and other groups. We should all be treated equally and fairly under the law, and Congress should have to follow the same laws it dictates to the rest of America. But as we continue to negotiate over this divide, let's start funding the things we agree on. Let's fund veterans programs. Let's fund the NIH clinical trials. Let's fund Head Start, WIC programs. Let's open up the World War II Memorial. Surely, even in the divided times we live in, we could set aside our differences and start reopening the doors of government. This shutdown is wrong and the American people are hurting. Let's please start working together, getting past our differences, finding points of agreement, and let's forge ahead together, united as Americans. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I request unanimous consent for just the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I rise today to correct the record uh, regarding the health benefits for members of Congress and their staff. Recently, many on the other side have been falsely claiming that Congress is trying to exempt itself from the Affordable Care Act in an effort to distract the public from their failure to do their job and keep our government open. The fact is that members of Congress and their staff are the only people who are required by law to give up current employer-provided health care and go into the exchanges. I support this because I know the exchanges will provide all Americans, including Congress and its staff, quality affordable health insurance. The exemption my friends want to get rid of is ending Congress's employer contribution, which all federal employees currently receive. Mr. Chairman, my Republican colleagues probably have, like many of us do, young staffers working in their offices that make around $25,000. We're going to ask these devoted self, uh, civil servants to pay $5,000 and $12,000 more per, per year for health insurance that they currently pay just to score a cheap political point. Ask the Speaker. He supports maintaining this contribution. Case closed. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Without objection, gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of Manufacturing Day. America is an exceptional nation. Over the last two and a quarter centuries, our country has been an example of freedom. Our founders' belief in the free enterprise system helped ignite a transformation in manufacturing that has changed the world. However, as we all know, arbitrary regulations and excessive taxation unfairly punishes hard-working Americans and impedes our industrial capability. This hurts our national strength that is simply unfair to our manufacturers, especially in the aftermath of a recession whose effects still linger to this day. I am proud to represent the second highest manufacturing district in the country. Every day I hear from Michiganders who share these concerns with me, instead of unnecessarily exerting its influence on the economy, the government should promote conditions that make it conducive to invest and grow our economy. As I always say, investment always goes where it is welcome and stays where it's appreciated. The goal of tax reform should be to grow the economy. If we want businesses, especially manufacturing businesses, to grow and create jobs, fixing depreciation rules by moving closer to full expensing would be a great start. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back my time. The time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady from California is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I remained appalled by the gimmicks that the House continues today. The majority claims that the bills before us will fund WIC and FEMA programs. But let's be clear. The only way these programs will be funded is by ending this irresponsible and reckless government shutdown. I have no doubt that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle want FEMA to function and WIC recipients to continue to receive life-sustaining nutritional benefits, but to put bills on the floor that pretend to take care of these issues when they do not, or to take care of the American people when they do not, is shameful. 
We should not be using FEMA and critical safety net programs as political footballs. Mr. Speaker, if we truly want to end this shutdown and help American families, we must allow a vote on the floor to end this government shutdown. Let us do what we all know is right. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nebraska seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my Without objection, the gentleman from Nebraska is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we can continue to march ourselves down here and throw barbs and insults at one another while watching our meager approval rating fall from 10 percent to perhaps 5 percent. We can continue to do that. Or maybe we can reframe this whole discussion and agree to something that we should keep working steadily to get this government back running while also working on the right type of policy reform, tax reform, and spending re reform that could restore America's greatness. Now, in the midst of this difficulty and in seemingly with no way out, this could actually be an historic moment. But it will take the House of Representatives and the President of the United States and the United States Senate talking to one another. That conversation must begin now. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Mr. Speaker, our democracy is supposed to be the example for the world. But the example we have set with this Republican government shutdown is beyond shameful. Some of my Republican colleagues are actually celebrating this shutdown, saying, quote, this is exactly what they wanted. Who are they listening to? It certainly isn't the American people. And I feel the survivors of Hurricane Sandy, who have lost everything, will be left without the relief they need. That the 31,000 federal workers in New Jersey on furlough will wonder how they'll make ends meet. I worry about the veterans who have fought for this country, but have come home to broken promises. And the more than 9 million women, infants, and children who will be cut from WIC, the nutritional assistance they need to survive. We cannot choose winners and losers in this fight. So I urge my Republican colleagues to act responsibly. Bring a clean CR to the floor and let's start working for the American people again because they shouldn't have to suffer for the Republicans' inability to govern any longer. And I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak out against this unnecessary Republican-led government shutdown. Republicans should work with Democrats to keep our government open. Republicans have cut off basic government services relied upon by millions of Americans, including millions of Americans who call themselves Republicans. This effort to shut down our government is costing hard-working taxpayers millions of dollars. 800,000 federal employees around the country didn't go to work this week and will not return to work until Republicans end this senseless shutdown. Instead of working across the aisle, Republicans would rather score political points with the Tea Party. They would rather take our government hostage over an issue that has been voted on in March of 2010 and upheld by the Supreme Court in June of 2012 and held to a public referendum by the re-election of President Obama in November of 2012. The Affordable Health Care Act is law. It has gone through checks and balances of our government and should not be an issue when it comes to funding our government. I ask my Republican colleagues to let, let us return to reason. Let's keep our government running. Let's do the right thing. Stop these games. Stop the obstruction. And let's get back to work on real issues. I yield back my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Mr. Speaker, this week a Republican colleague spoke of the need to shut down the government. He said, we just want to help Americans get past one of the most insidious laws ever created by man. He's referring to the Affordable Care Act, but his words sounded eerily familiar to statements from this body's past. A congressman once said, Never in the history of the world 
Has any measure been brought here so insidiously designed as to prevent business recovery and to enslave workers? Another one said, we cannot stand idly by now as the nation embarks on an ill-conceived adventure in government medicine from which the patient will be the ultimate sufferer. These aren't quotes about the Affordable Care Act. The quotes are from Congressman Tabor in 1935, opposing Social Security, and from Congressman Hall in 1965, opposing Medicare. What if opponents of Social Security and Medicare shut down the entire government because they didn't get their way? What if the majorities gave in to the demands of those on the wrong side of history? This country would be very different today. These may be forgotten, but this reckless shutdown will not be, and the American people will remember who caused it. I yield For what back. purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 371 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 65, House Resolution 371, resolved that upon adoption of this resolution it shall be in order to consider in the House any joint resolution specified in Section 2 of this resolution. All points of order against consideration of each such joint resolution are waived. Each such joint resolution shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in each such joint resolution are waived. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on each such joint resolution and on any amendment thereto to final passage without intervening motion, except one, 40 minutes of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations, and two, one motion to recommit. Section two, the joint resolutions referred to in the first section of this resolution are as follows. A. The Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 75, making continuing appropriations for the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for women, infants, and children for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. B. The Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 76, making continuing appropriations for the National Nuclear Security Administration for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. C. The Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 77, making continuing appropriations for the Food and Drug Administration for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. D. The Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 78, making continuing appropriations for National Intelligence Program operations for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. E. The Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 79, making continuing appropriations for certain components of the Department of Homeland Security for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. F. The Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 80, making continuing appropriations for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Education, and the Indian Health Service for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. G, the Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 82, making continuing appropriations for the National Weather Service for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. H, the Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 83, making continuing appropriations for the Impact Aid Program of the Department of Education for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. I, the Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 84, making continue, continuing appropriations for Head Start for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. J, the Joint Resolution, House Joint Resolution 85, making continuing appropriations for the Federal Emergency Management Agency for fiscal year 2014 and for other purposes. Section 3, upon adoption of this resolution, it shall be in order to consider in the House the bill H.R. 3223 to provide for the compensation of furloughed federal employees. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. The bill shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions in the bill are waived. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and on any amendment thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one. 40 minutes of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, and two, one motion to recommit. 
Section 4, the requirement of Clause 6A of Rule 13 for a two-thirds vote to consider a report from the Committee on Rules on the same day it is presented to the House is waived with respect to any resolution reported through the legislative day of October 21, 2013. Section 5. It shall be in order at any time through the calendar day of October 20th, 2013, for the Speaker to entertain motions that the House suspend the rules as though under Clause 1 of Rule 15. The Speaker or his designee shall consult with the Minority Leader or her designee on the designation of any matter for consideration pursuant to this section. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for one hour. Mr. Speaker, for the purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentlelady from Rochester, my good friend Mrs. Slaughter, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. During the consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purposes of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Rules Committee met and reported a rule for consideration of ten different joint resolutions, all of which demonstrate House Republicans' continuing commitment to reopen necessary portions of our government. The rule is a closed rule which provides for 40 minutes of debate between the Chairman and Ranking Member of the Committee on Appropriations for each joint resolution. Additionally, the rule provides 40 minutes of debate between the chairman and ranking member of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform for H.R. 3223, the Federal Employee Retroactive Pay Fairness Act. The rule also provides a motion to recommit for each bill or joint resolution. Additionally, the rule extends same-day authority for resolutions reported by the Rules Committee through the legislative day of October 21, 2013, thus continuing to allow the House the flexibility to continue to address the government shutdown. Finally, the rule permits the Speaker to entertain motions to suspend the rules until October 20. Here we are again, Mr. Speaker, day four of a government shutdown. Unfortunately for the American people, not much has changed. The Senate is still recalcitrant, unwilling to consider legislation that would reopen parts of the government. I do want to add an exception, though, and add uh, thank our friends in the upper chamber for actually uh, agreeing with us to exempt our military from these cuts, both uh, civilian and, and uniform. The Senate also, however, is still unwilling to go to conference to discuss the very serious fiscal issues facing this country. The Senate's unwilling to consider any of the five pieces of legislation the House passed in the last two days which will reopen parts of our government. Even so, House Republicans continue to bring legislation to the floor to meet the needs of American citizens. Today's rule will allow for consideration of resolutions that reopen the Bureau of Indian Education, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Indian Health Service, the WIC program, the National Weather Center, FEMA, our intelligence agencies, Impact Aid, Head Start, and the list goes on and on. In addition, Mr. Speaker, this rule makes clear our commitment to the 800,000 federal workers currently furloughed that they will indeed be paid. It's not their fault that Washington is dysfunctional, that Congress can't agree on the size and scope of government, yet they are caught in the crossfire wondering if they'll be able to afford their mortgages and pay their utility bills. Mr. Speaker, that simply isn't fair. H.R. 3223, of which I'm a proud co-sponsor, would codify what we have done in every previous government shutdown pay our federal employees from the date of the government shutdown on. And I particularly want to compliment uh, in a bipartisan fashion our friends Mr. Moran, Mr. Wolf, who worked uh, together on this measure, brought it forward and gathered many dozens of co-sponsors uh, from both sides of the aisle. Quite frankly, I think their example of bipartisanship and working together is something that uh, we could all uh, learn from. Mr. Speaker, Democrats and Republicans alike agree that it's, that's the responsible thing to do. House Republicans are working to deal with the real world problems of our constituents. Republicans are working to reopen the government. However, we lack a willing partner in the Senate and in the President. Every time we've attempted to negotiate with them, they've told us to accept their plan. They've even rebuffed our attempts to go to conference. 
Therefore, House Republicans have been left with little choice except passing a number of smaller bills to see if the Senate would be willing to accept those. And again, I remark on one occasion with respect to the military, they did indeed accept one. So I would urge them to do that with the others. I urge support for the rule and the underlying legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentlelady from New York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my good friend for yielding me the time and yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, unless the silent members of the majority speak up, today's debate is a fait accompli. For the last two days, members of the majority have said publicly that they wish this government shutdown would end. In fact, a coalition of more than 218 Democrats and Republicans has publicly declared that they are ready to vote on the clean CR, and 218 would be the majority and we would pass it. And that's why the powerful minority who's taken the government hostage is doing all it can again today to prevent the Senate CR from coming to the House floor. It doesn't make any sense. Last night, actually, none of it makes sense. If were we to do that, we wouldn't have to be here today trying to do these piecemeal pieces. Last night, the Rules Committee proposed a rule for these 11 piecemeal funding bills before us today. They didn't go through a single meeting of the committee at least in the committee process, subcommittees and committee would have given both Republicans and Democrats an opportunity to weigh in on these measures. And remember that half the population of the United States is represented by Democrats, and that in the last election, Democrats members for uh, uh, candidates for Congress achieved a million more votes than our Republican friends. But we are shut out of the process. Indeed, these bills were written yesterday afternoon, brought straight to the Rules Committee, as so many are lately, in order to be rushed to the floor. During our hearing, a colleague promised that the reckless approach would continue, even suggesting that we could see 150 more of these peace mail bills before the majority agrees to end the government shutdown. That should take us to sometime this, well, maybe October of next year. Well, while they fail to take 150 votes on bills, the president would veto, and everybody knows the president would veto it, and the Senate will reject it. They haven't allowed a single vote on the cure to the problem. Bring up the CR, put the government back to work. Fortunately for the American people, no minority, no matter how powerful, can stop the will of the House if we exercise it. Unlike the Senate, a majority in the House can only be held back for so long. Thanks to the Democrat spirit baked into our chamber's rules, a majority will always succeed. For the more than 218 members, a majority, who have expressed a desire to vote on the clean CR, our most powerful tool is voting down the previous question and bringing the clean Senate CR to the floor for the, uh, to, to vote on. Now, earlier this week, my Democrat colleagues and I urged the chamber to vote no on the previous question so that we could bring the Senate bill to the floor. Not a single Republican joined our cause. Today, we're going to give you another chance. Following the debate on the rule, we will have a chance to vote down the previous question. And while that may simply be legislative language to most people, what that will do will be give us an opportunity, those of us who very strongly believe this government should work, an opportunity to bring the CR, bring the, sequester, uh, bring the uh, shutdown to a close, and put everybody back to work. We get actually, I want to see that by the end of this day that we can accomplish that because words are no longer enough. Those members of the majority who claim that they want to end the government shutdown get the opportunity today to stand up and vote. As I said the other day, when we had the same opportunity, I would like them to put their voting cards where their mouths are. Over the next hour, I encourage every member of this chamber to reflect on the damage that has already been wrought on our nation because of the shutdown and the damage that will ensue if we wait another day. The shutdown is costing the nation $300 million a day, and more than 800,000 workers are furloughed without pay. Now, today we're going to vote, and I, I think almost unanimously, to pay them when the shutdown ends. A logical person would say, why don't you bring them back to work? If they're going to be paid anyway, let them work. 
There's no answer for that. There must be some reason here that is available to only a few people as to why the majority wants to keep this country, the uh, government shut down. And we have to also end this because our State Department and intelligence employees need to come back on the job. A hurricane is barreling down right now on the state of Louisiana. Eighty percent of the FEMA workers are furloughed. Then the NASA had to turn off the Mars rover, which was giving us so much information about the universe, stopping all the space exploration in its tracks. I think one of the best things I've read to describe what we're doing in this house was said by a Republican. Because there is no plan here, there is no end game here, they're saying that what they are doing is laying the track ahead of the speeding train as it bears down on them. The majority started to shut down because they were dead set on repealing the Affordable Care Act. And I think by doing this piecemeal, they think they can still do that. Although the process that they've issued, they have dire predictions about the health care law and warn that the law would hurt American workers, is absolutely turning out not to be truth. In the last week, two of our nation's biggest companies have responded to the Affordable Care Act by giving tens of thousands of their part-time employees full-time jobs. Guess who they are? One is the largest employer in the United States, Walmart. They are raising 35,000 of their part-time employees to become full-time employees to make them eligible for health insurance. Walt Disney announced that 427 employees at Disney World will be hired as, who have been hired as full-time employees will be given access to the health insurance plan. And we hear all the time that Delta Airlines, and I've really got to research this, Delta Airlines has said, they tell me, that the Affordable Care Plan would cost them $100 million a year. I surely would like to know how that's possible unless they plan to hire 70 million new employees, uh, which would certainly be good for the employment, but I see no earthly reason for them to do that. We need to know whether that's true or not, since all the rest of the dire predictions have turned out not to be. The Affordable Care Act is working, but because of the majority, the government is not. And it's time for the majority to give up this losing game. I strongly urge my colleagues to vote no on the rule, the underlying legislation, and so importantly, I vote, urge a no vote on the previous question. And then, Mr. Speaker, we can bring the clean Senate CR to the House floor, as we should have done weeks ago, and end this government shutdown today. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady's time is reserved. Gentleman from Oklahoma. I thank uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to address a couple of uh, points uh, that my good friend raises, but before I do, uh, I want to agree with her that uh, I think we all think the government ought to be open. I actually don't think there's much division uh, about that, and uh, folks have actually tried to do that. On our side of the aisle, Every single piece of legislation we have brought to the floor during this period has either kept the government open in whole or in part, and I suspect we'll continue to try and do that. So it's not the aim of either side here to shut down the government. In terms of the Affordable Health Care Act, I certainly don't support it, voted against it, have voted multiple times to repeal it and delay it, but I'll agree with my good friend on that, too, in the sense that uh, uh, you know, there are times when we have actually worked together on both sides of the aisle to change it. My friends like to uh, quite often mention there's been 41 or two efforts to, quote, repeal, delay, defund the bill. What they usually forget to add, and what, frankly, some people on our side forget to add, is seven of those have actually succeeded. Uh, that is, a Democratic Senate, Democratic President agreed with them. Uh, and the proposals that we have on the table now in terms of the Affordable Health Care Act are in eminently sensible and overwhelmingly popular. The first one is quite simply, we just don't think that political appointees and elected officials ought to be treated differently than other Americans. Now, we can get into a big fight about health care, but the reality is, uh, right now, under the law, members of Congress and their staff can bring subsidies with them on the exchange. No, no other American can do that. Now, we can do this either way, as far as I'm concerned. I could leave them back as federal employees, and they would be treated like every other federal employee. That's a, an acceptable solution to me, at least. 
or we could allow other Americans to bring subsidies onto the exchange, just like members of Congress. But the underlying principle is we ought to treat them all the same. Washington political elite shouldn't be treated differently than the average American. The second thing is, I think, very simple. We're not talking about uh, uh, delaying all of Obamacare, but if we're going to allow big businesses to wait a year before they implement what they're required to do, if we're going to allow 1,100 organizations, many labor unions to do it, why shouldn't we allow the average American at their choice to delay as well? If they don't want to delay, they can go on to the exchanges, the subsidies are still there, the tax programs are still there. Why shouldn't the average American have the same privilege that we've bestowed on big business, big labor, and countless other organizations? That's what we're talking about. Now, my friend's uh, uh, points here, I, I, and I suspect this is true of the debt ceiling a little bit further down the road, the, the Democratic approach is very simple. Do everything I want, and then I'm willing to negotiate. Well, we would like to sit down and talk now and see if we could find some common ground. We've got uh, negotiators, conferees is the technical title, available to sit down, find common ground. We're not asking for something that's uh, uh, unreasonable in my view, and we're certainly not do is proposing something that uh, you know is outside the scope of the type of things we've been able to agree on before. The president, I want to add, has taken the same approach that the Senate has taken with regard to the continuing resolution with the debt ceiling. Uh, he's just simply said we have to ra raise it unilaterally. That's not a particularly popular vote, probably on either side of the aisle. It's certainly not on my side of the aisle. Uh, but, you know, I'm willing to work with the president on the debt ceiling. I did it in 2011. And I just want to note for the record that's something he never did when he was a member of the United States Senate. Uh, he didn't vote to raise the debt ceiling when he had the opportunity to do it. Instead, he engaged in a lecture about debt. Well, probably was a lecture that was needed. But regardless, he did not do for George Bush what he's asking us to do for him. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to work with him on the debt ceiling. If you voted for the Ryan budget, you envision the debt ceiling as being something that has to be raised while you deal with the underlying deficit. Uh, but I do want to do something or be in a negotiation with the president about what to do on that deficit. I don't think that's an unreasonable position. So I think the real central issue in this is not the Affordable Health Care Act, not the debt ceiling, and frankly, uh, not even the, the government shutdown, as serious as that is. The real issue is, will my friends and the President of the United States simply come to the table to negotiate? Uh, will they put a counterproposal out there? Or is it simply going to be, we insist getting our way in full all the time? don't think that's an acceptable way uh, to, uh, to arrive at common ground, and I don't think it's likely to succeed. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I will uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentlelady from New York. Mr. Speaker, 